you know, try things. You, you, you guys are young, you have a lot of runway. Try some things, you can test things out. You don't have to decide today what you're gonna be for the rest of your life. And um, I think you've got choices and you can try stuff. And you should, and you should test it and see if it's worthwhile. Okay, you guys, let's, uh, let's jump into the first part of these three um, big subheadings. So passions, we're going to talk about igniting our passions to begin with. So how, how do you find your passions? Maybe that's the first thing we can think about. In your reading or just in your own thinking, before the reading or outside the reading, like how would we go about thinking through like what our passion is? Probably several, several good answers here, yeah. I'd probably say that for which you are with mm. Let's Class is missed. We're done. That's excellent. Um, okay. Now, how do you figure out that for which you're willing to suffer? Personalize it. Really? I feel like it's like any love in you. Yeah. Consistently. Consi that's the key. That's great. Consistently. Because passion has to do with actual emotions, too. So that, it should definitely touch on that. A buddy of mine who's a writer, he put it nicely. He said, um, writing is a thing that I can't not do. Right? So maybe that is a pretty good way of thinking about passion. That even if it literally hurts your fingers to type a book, you would still do it. Now you guys are like, who would ever do that? This guy, right? So believe it or not, and this is, I, I, I can just share this now. Um, one of the things, this is kind of coming later, but one of the things that's actually true of me is that when I write, meaning type, it's actually physically painful, believe it or not. Um, most of my emailing to you guys or whatever, um, a lot of times I'll try to use my phone and just do voice dictation because it's literally painful for me to type. And you guys are like, how did you type a book or whatever? I suffered. I was willing to suffer. Um, but, and it's still to this day, like writing a syllabus is painful for me. It's people are like, that's weird. That's crazy. And why are you a writer? It's, uh, it's what God has called me to, I believe, in part. Um, I, just really quick while we're on this. I want to talk about Rick Warren again. Um, as we mentioned last time, right? Every sermon he's preached over 39 years has been a painful, ex physically just painful experience for him. Where after a sermon, he would literally have to go into the coldest room he can find in the church and do nothing but lie down. Otherwise, he'll suffer vertigo and all sorts of things that come with his very particular condition that even the folks at Mayo Clinic, all over the world, there's only like 16 people apparently who has this reverse neurology where adrenaline hurts him. <laughs> Physically, it's painful. You wouldn't know it by looking at him, and his calling is to speak, so adrenaline happens all the time, so every sermon is painful, but he's called to it, right? And he's willing to suffer because he's passionate about it. Um, it's kind of funny, at the other university where I used to teach, um, we had a professor, my colleague, actually my mentor, um, who you'll see here, but Dr. Horner, he has a very acute mold allergy, so that the, for years doctors couldn't figure out like why does he just seemingly get the flu symptoms like every single day, like every like all year round, and they finally figured out it's because he has a particular acute allergy to micro molds, which are found guess where. In, in books, so here's a professor, as we like to joke, who couldn't read, and then here's a professor who couldn't write. <laughs> like that was that was us, right? But that, but but he's willing to suffer that, and so there's ways around that. He, what he did is took his entire library, and with the help of his daughter, they literally um, digitized all the books that he uses, like in his entire office. And so he, they, they got one of those machines where you cut the spine and then you scan it really fast, and now it becomes a digital book. So all of his books are now digital. Um, that's one of the ways he gets around it. But sometimes he can't get around it, and there are just micro molds in the library or wherever. And this is part of his calling, right? And so that's, yes, like what are we willing to suffer for consistently, right? Um, okay, um, I, I tried to suggest, uh, please don't write this down, you can maybe reference the page number, but I tried to suggest some questions that can kind of help us think through what Briley was kind of describing. It's on page 49 of the book, right? And it's this thing that really, that we can't not do. Right, um, and then maybe um, so that's internal, okay. 
but let's balance it out. Like, what if you what if you what if you sit for like five weeks, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for three hours, and pray to God that He would reveal to you what your passions are? And after those five long weeks, you're like, I still don't know, <laughs> right? Well, let's balance it out. It's maybe not just internal. Maybe it's, so to speak, external. These two profs from Stanford teach the most popular class. It's like this version, but like at Stanford. Out of thousands of people that they've taught and so on and so forth, they found that passion for most people comes after they try something, discover that they like it, develop mastery, not before. So sometimes it's like five days of meditating for five hours and the Lord might reveal to you this. Are you with me? But sometimes it's just go out and do the thing and try five things and realize, ah, that fourth one was like the world of difference to me. Right? Um, quick example of this. Again, I've just pointed a lot of different things in, in my life because it's just easiest to point to. But hopefully you'll be able to do this for yourself. But um, I think I might have briefly described this. But remember this time where my friends and I were invited to give, uh, a, we did a conference on the Philippines. So it was like a 16 hour flight to get there. We landed about more noon and then the conference started in the evening so it's like we've been up for 24 hours by the time i gave the last talk and then we had an hour and a half q a right that's just nuts are you guys with me we flew over stayed up so we don't get jet lag and then we gave the, con the first night of the conference we had five days of conference left or sorry four left it was five days total and then the mc Afterwards, you know, if you've ever been to Manila, they're a very fun loving culture. And so, in this context of like 300 pastors and leaders, the MC grabs the mic from me after the QA. Well, you were born in the Philippines, so Josh, you would know. But he goes, How many of you guys would like to do another hour and a half QA? And they're all like, Oh, yay, right? And then I, again, half jokingly, just grabbed the mic back from the MC. And I was like, I would love to, because I was just so enjoying it. And we we're just in this flow, and it was great. And that's not actually the, the place in the Philippines. I just want to give you a, an, Im an image of it. And then my, I look over at my team, and they're like, uh-uh, we're done. Like, we got to get rest, go back, so we can get ready for the next day. But um, I was just so in that flow. And then I, when we did get back to where we were staying, I jumped on my laptop. Of course, time difference. But my, my mentor, who was stateside, California, the one that middle Dr. David Horner, at, um, he teaches at Biola, I jumped online, and I wrote to him, and I said, Dave, I think I know what I was born for. And then he happened to be online, even though the time difference, he just wrote back right away. And I still remember what he said. He said, this is like 10, more than 10 years ago, I was like 15, close to 15. He said, Rich, pay, he said something very strange. He said, pay attention to your body. This doesn't happen to most people in their life, if ever. Pay attention to your body. And I was like, I know Dave teaches at Biola. Did he go like Eastern mysticism on me? Like, what is this pay attention to your body? Like, is it... Is it namas, whatever, like namas, whatever, like what is this, right? Um, and so then I was like, this is really striking. And I don't think I figured out really what he meant by that until much later. I tried to take my, his advice best I could, but there is something in the doing of it that makes you come alive. And that's a great way to discern um, your passion because oftentimes it comes after. That's why internships are important. This is why, and I just put out a little YouTube video on this, but this is why gap years, I think, can be very effective. Because you take a year off after college and you try three things like in a very deep level, like at a serious level, and then you figure out, wait a second, that third thing was it, right? But you wouldn't know it until, I, like they write, Dave, Dave and, and Bur Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, they write about how Dave went all the way to grad school studying marine biology because somehow he thought that, that he loved animals and so he figured that's going to be him. He went all the way to grad school and he finished and he was like, wait a second, I've never actually once worked with um, animals in that context and he realized he went to grad school for no reason. <laughs> so it's like figure it out as you do the thing rather than like, uh, I sat for three hours, I figured it out and now I'm going to go to grad school. Let's, let's do the thing as it were. Try it out. So the simple um, example of trial and error. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So I think it's a little bit of both. Internal, like Bradley was describing, but external, as these folks are describing. <laughs> if you could give us one piece of advice on discovering calling, what would you say? It's probably about, you know, testing out a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, try things. You, you, you guys are young, you have a lot of runway. Try some things, you can test things out. You don't have to decide today what you're gonna be for the rest of your life. And um, 
I think you've got choices and you can try stuff. And you should. And you should test it and see if it, it's worthwhile. Think you're a filmmaker and think you're good? Then go make a film. Mm -hmm. Make a short film. See, see if anybody reacts uh -huh. or likes it or pays attention. Uh -huh. Then you'll find out. Yeah, to add to do what Ralph says too, I think it's a lot easier to steer a ship that's already out in the ocean than one that's just sitting at the dock. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for God to give you direction in life, I think that probably one of the best things you can do is, is get out there and put your hand to different things that he can direct you yeah. through circumstances and the, the voice of other people and, and his spirit than if you, you just wait and sit and say, where God, where, where are you leading me? What, what should I do? I think to Ralph's point, getting out and, and trying something yeah. is very helpful. Yeah. You know, Oz Guinness wrote a book on call and call, The Call, <laughs> and uh, he was being interviewed, but he said the first piece of advice I would give, trial and error. Mm -hmm. he, you were waiting for something profound and, you know, and so forth, but he, he said trial and error. He tried being a pastor, tried being a missionary that didn't work out, writing and speaking in slightly different area, that worked out. But, yeah, I felt the same. Just it's a great time to experiment, Yeah, you know, in college and post-college. You got, you got, there's plenty of room. You don't have, you're not married yet. You don't have a house. You don't have to worry about all that stuff and all those bills. And take a chance. Travel. Try some stuff. Try some weird stuff. <laughs> because you you won't have a chance to do that when you're 40. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen. Then then you're weird trying weird stuff. <laughs> I should stop. Now, I guess. Yeah, you should stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, going off of that trial and error, what was kind of like the biggest mistake you've made that we could learn from or glean from you and what you caution us with as far as trial and error goes or even beyond that? That's a great question. What's the mistake? Um, I try not to focus on my mistakes. So <laughs> think about that. I don't know. Maybe I didn't try enough. I mean, I didn't try enough things. Mm -hmm. I'm attracted to politics now, and I never did anything with that when I was younger, and I should have. Should have interned, should have tried that, should have see, you know, see if that made any sense for me. So I, I think I probably didn't try enough things. I was probably a little too, I came out of a church, you know, environment with my friends. All my friends were going to seminary, so I was kind of like on that path. Maybe that's what I should do. And it was only sort of the job in terms of, um, I got married right out of college, get a job, and that job started to shape what I was about because mm -hmm. I was sort of forced into it as opposed to you know there's sort of a trend now of like taking a, a break or a year off or, or like there's a word for that right gap year gap year there we go so um, that would have been cool mm -hmm. you know in a older generations that might have been drafted in the military that you get a chance to sort of take a break and evaluate and I didn't really do that as much mm -hmm. as I wanted to so I think again trial and error try some stuff don't book it all up so quickly. Yeah. So do you feel like you're evaluating now? Oh, I think I'm still asking those questions. Mm -hmm. You know, why am I here? What am I doing? What's the best, highest thing I should be doing? Yeah. And I've got less runway, so I'm concerned about, you know, uh, what what course corrections do I have left? Mm -hmm. uh, you're you've got so much more that you can choose from. Mm -hmm. So if I could go back. I'd go back and, and try more things. We'll talk a little bit more about Michael Phelps, but this is kind of a neat um, thing here where Phelps, you all remember him, right, just dominated the Olympics. He actually is the most decorated Olympian there ever was in history. Like, some, he has more medals than like 170 countries combined. It's kind of crazy, right? He has like 20 some medal and like whatever of them are gold. But here's any swimmer, if you notice, I like the example because when swimmers are in a race, just like we're in the race for the kingdom, um, what you notice is like they will like strip down to the bare minimum. They will, men and women both, will shave every hair follicle because every little weight is going to be something that slows them down. Now, it's not sin to wear certain things in the pool, but you certainly want to get rid of all weight. And so when we're in this race and ignite, trying to ignite our passion, so to speak, th I think this is a good illustration of that. Now, 
can't we see therefore why when we read Jesus' words about how we have to hate mother, father, wife, and children, now we can see what he's saying, right? Um, it's a hyperbole, but now there's a context for it in the case of a race, right? Leo said, you don't carry a large bag with you when you're running a race, just like you don't carry anything that you don't have to when you're swimming in a race. So this isn't a time for, for us right now, but maybe there, as you think about your calling, is there a weight or a sin, maybe both, in some cases, it's one or the other for uh, different, different ones of us. But is there something in our lives where we're studying calling here, we're trying to figure out how to define it, discern it, and then deploy it, right, actually use it. But is there something in our lives that, that might be keeping us from fully flourishing for God because it's a weight or a sin, sin being more outright, the weight still being a hindrance anyway? So this is something for us to think about. Um, I'm going to, uh, is there any questions? Okay, I'm going to um, hustle on to the next sub point which is growing our passion so once we've uh, begun to identify and, and, and really get a start on our passions how do we grow that so it's a bit more uh, sustainable and there are three things that Hebrews 12 I'm all I'm dra- drawing all this from Hebrews 12 uh, which you read I, I hope uh, in the chapter but there are three ways it's to run with endurance it's to see the great cloud of witnesses and then it's to look to Jesus so we're going to start with running with endurance and we're going we're to kind of hustle here a bit <laughs> uh, speaking of which so Here's the first bit, running with endurance. Um, as I've shared with you already, the example of um, Pastor Rick Warren, there, there, there I was at the service there and took a picture when he was talking about how every sermon was deep pain for him. And, and in my case too, of like literally to this day, um, how it hurts to type. Um, what, what it, the reason it hurts to type, by the way, is because in my, it wasn't always like this. I wasn't born like this. But uh, my first year of my doctoral program, they encouraged us, hey, you want to get to writing your thesis as soon as possible. So I took that very seriously. So literally four hours every morning, and then um, I wrote. And then four hours in the afternoon, I read. And that was my Monday through Friday. That was my, my, my defil. That's how I did my entire doctorate. Um, uh, almost every, like it was like clockwork. My buddy Max and I would cycle into the library at nine o'clock. Got the b- best seats. We nerded out. We got the best seats in the library. It was this beautiful library. I wish I had a picture of it. And then we took a half hour lunch. And then the rest of the four hours in the afternoon, I read. Um, and then everything I read, I tried to put into the writing the next morning. I just reci- cycled that, re- recycled that for basically three years. Um, but midway through like my second year or so, I no- I noticed that my fingers were really being. Really, it became really painful from all the typing. Uh, you're supposed to write 100,000 words, which is 300 pages for you know your dissertation. Um, that was my dissertation, and I, now it's published. I think some of you guys have read it from my other class, but that was my dissertation. But here's the thing. I'm kind of nuts. This is the way I work, but I didn't write 100,000 words. I actually wrote 300,000 words. It was 900 pages, um, but you know you can only submit a hun- a 300 of those, so I I, I use those other things for other things, but um, but that's what. So then, thank goodness, when I started working, they I got an iPhone, and so I had a lot of emailing I needed to do. So what I did is I used my thumbs to do all my emailing, believe it or not, right? So I, I worked at Templeton and emailed like crazy, and that was. And then my thumbs started hurting, and so now all my fingers hurt, and this is why I use voice dictation. But this is this is kind of what it means, I guess, run with endurance. Now, just to contrast that. This is something I call the final cut culture, right? Um, this is just a time, ter- term I came up with. You know, Kevin would be much more familiar with some of you guys who do like Adobe Premiere or you know about Final Cut Pro. This is where I'm getting it from. And the, simp- the, uh, the idea is very simple. To go back to swimming a little bit, here's like, here, here he is again, Michael Phelps, right? And I actually wanted to show you a little video because it, it's really exciting, these, these races, but um, time's sake. But it, here he is like far in the lead, right? Michael Phelps, just an you know, amazing athlete. But a lot of times, and I don't mean this, I don't think we do this consciously, but unconsciously as a culture, we become a final cut culture, meaning all we see is the final cut, like the three minutes that the race is, and forget that for three decades or two or at least one, or the 10,000 hour theory, are you with me? Like they have been in the pool for hours and years and maybe decades. But all we see is the three minutes of the Olympics and, or back on Rewind on YouTube and we're like, oh, look at that. Yeah, if I just, yeah, I can probably do that. Just give me three minutes, you know? And I'm not saying we can't, obviously we don't consciously say that, but I think it's so ingrained within our culture because of YouTube and social media and so on and so forth. I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad, but I am saying that's what happens unconsciously. So we forget that there are decades of 
so most of us are like, I'm 20, so by 22, I should be crushing it. <laughs> Whereas, let me show with you, uh, here's uh, Oz again, but um, we were on a drive one time, and Oz said something that I, very recently to me, uh, this is about well, three years ago, we were driving actually along PCH, and he said to me, um, how is the book writing going? I was like, oh, yeah, it's going okay. And it's kind of cool when you have a mentor, and Kayla was asking, what, how do you find a mentor? And so let's, we can talk about that too, maybe at, toward the end, like Q&A. But like, uh, he said something to me. He said, how's the book going? I was like, oh, yeah, it's going okay. Like, this is three years ago, and I was still trying to finish up this book in the calling book. And then he was like, um, he was like what, what do you mean? And I explained, and he goes, okay, well, you're like 75% done? I'm like, yeah, give or take. He's like, all right, well, it's, it was like October or whenever it was. He's like, all right, well, then I see you at Christmas. Um, I want to see it done. Like, only your mentor can actually say that, and you, it, they put enough of, of like a love and fear in you. You're like, oh my gosh, Oscar has just told me he's got to see my book. And so, sure enough, I that's what did. So, mentorship has a lot of benefits. But more recently, when we were hanging out, he said, um, he said, Rich, you know, now that you know you're in your 20s, just kidding. He said, now that you're in your 40s, come on, you guys, I don't even get like a sympathy laugh. He goes, he goes between 40 and 60 should be your most productive years. Generally speaking, it's not a rule of, it's not you know, hard and fast, but generally speaking, between 40 and 60 should be your most productive years. And that stuck with me. And it, it puts enough of a, of a framework in my life where I'm like, yeah, as I am now in my 40s, I need to be thinking through that carefully. And again, don't get me wrong, right? Like Bach did it when he was 22 and you know, so on forth, so forth, right? But generally speaking, so I got to thinking about that. You know me and my alliterations. I began thinking, okay, what does that mean? Well, maybe our 20s and 30s then are for, so to speak, tilling, right? It's just tilling the ground. It's just grinding it out, 10,000 hour theory and, and then some, right? Um, and then your 40s and your 50s are for flourishing. That's when your practical and the passion, we talked about that, the practical and the passion, they begin to converge. And you can actually make money from your calling and then you have that fourth circle. You know what I'm talking about, right? Everyone good? Everyone with me? Any questions on that? And then I would just say the 60s and 70s is like, that's for sowing back into the next generation. These are mentors come in, pour in to those who are in their 20s and 30s, right? So 20s and 30s are for tilling, you just till the ground, and then you flourish and you, you grow and you, and you crush it as it were. And then the 60s and 70s are for sowing back in to the next generation. So now I want to talk a little bit about the role of mental health in terms of fulfilling our calling. I think there obviously is a, uh, a connection between like, okay, I know my calling now. Uh, what if like something like anxiety or depression or something else in my mental life keeps me from really pursuing my calling? And so again, one more time, referring back to this gentleman here, Michael Phelps. Some of you guys know his story. After the, was it was the 2012 London Olympics, he, went, he battled this major um, crisis of depression. And as a result of that, he, he almost lost it. He, he stayed in his hotel room for five nights and like he was at the brink of death. He wanted to take his life and he couldn't eat for five days. He couldn't sleep for five days, nearly five days. Um, and he, all he could think about was ending his life. Uh, so you can read about his story. Now, um, thank God, uh, literally thank God, that um, his, God's grace reached him. And he tells about the stories in the interviews now. But uh, Phelps, some of you guys know his story, right? He was contacted by a friend of his, Ray Lewis, who played pro NFL before. And Ray Lewis spoke to him and said, hey, Mike, you can't, you can't go now because if you lose, we all lose. That was Ray's thing. And then he said, I encourage you to check out this place called Meadows in Arizona. It's like a rehab center. Um, and, and just feel, dealing with mental anxiety, actually, was the biggest thing for him. And so he... My point is you can get to the highest heights of calling, but if your mental life isn't healthy, then it's going to deter us from fulfilling our calling. Um, and so, so Ray Lewis says, look, do that. Check yourself into the meadows, and let me also give you a book. So he gave him uh, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and it completely changed his life. And so, um, and so now he talks about it. And so I want to share a little bit. Now, this is a little bit odd because... This is a class on calling. It's about the theology of calling. But here's a takeaway. I want to talk about how mental, physical, and spiritual are all connected. I had a, a professor in grad school who, um, he's an eminent like, philosopher or whatever, and we're just studying philosophy. In fact, we're studying like, the philosophy of time. It's like 
how can anything you know be connected to that, right? But he began each of his lectures, our lectures, with like five minutes on very practical pieces of advice, right? Um, uh, I won't go into all the other like like study t all kinds of, but one of the practical pieces of advice he gave us was like workout tips, and we're like, here's William Lane Craig, like a famous, brilliant philosopher who debates like atheists and blah 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 and he's like giving us workout he's literally showing us like the triangle like when you increase the reps you decrease the weight like it was like what like wh where are we right but now that I look back like 10 years later on my grad school time I realized wait a second like he was onto something he was sh sh saying that philosophy is not just about like can you figure out this problem but can you live a, a healthy life <laughs> so this happened as recently as like five months ago so Wednesday morning hits and it's like I don't know like nine o'clock in the morning and I've already like kind of gotten ready and I've got like an extra I don't know half hour to work with that I could literally I could like I could have worked for half an hour I could have worked out for half an hour I could have just called a friend I could I, you know I mean, you, know, you ever get into those times where they got a random half hour you're like I don't know what to do really should I just study or should I hang out it's not you know what I mean like so I had that random half hour and I knew I was gonna have enough time to still like get ready and then head out so I was like, what do I do? And I, <laughs> this is weird. Like I was literally standing in my living room, just like staring at the floor for like five minutes. I was like, hmm, what do I do? I'm like, I, I just didn't know what to do. Ever, ever get in those weird funks where you're just like, I just literally don't know what I want to do, what I should do. So I just stalled for like, and I only caught myself. I'm like, wait, what just happened? So for five minutes, I was like, I don't know what I should do. And there's like, life was just happening and hitting me in multiple sides. And I was like, ah. Oh, so look, I could have read the Bible for half an hour. I could have prayed for half an hour. And there are times for that, of course, and I do. But in that moment, something told me, like, just work out. And so I did. I put on a YouTube video. I followed it along. And I just, I just worked out. And it wasn't like anything like spiritual in that sense. But I can tell you this. After that simple half hour work, uh, workout, I, ever so slightly, these depressive thoughts and anxiousness that I was experiencing just a half an hour earlier lifted by just that much more. Are you with me? And it's this whole thing we talked about last time where like oftentimes our affections follow our actions. And so we're supposed to have, go ahead and do the thing even if we don't feel like doing it. And then it will build a cycle of, of, of hope and of, of a lift, right? Excuse me. So I'm saying this as someone who's like a fellow pilgrim. And I, and I don't know, some of you guys have um, strong mental health, others of you guys are, are struggling. And I'm just telling you that I'm probably somewhere in between. I guess I'm just trying to encourage you. I didn't have this part of the lecture written out and typed up and everything. I just, I'm just wanting to like speak off the cuff a little bit here. But I, um, I, I'll just say this, and this is close to home, so to speak, at Vanguard, because less than a year ago, you, you know the Stecklines, right? Uh, the pastor who took his own life, he was a VU alum, and his wife, Kayla Stecklein, now has this movement, God, God's Got This. This pastor took his own life, and he was struggling with mental health issues that some people knew about, but no one knew it was that deep. After a sermon, he just took his own life. Some of you guys know this, that literally last Monday, there was another pastor locally who also was at a flourishing church. Pastor, right? You know, we say, oh, pastor, right? Uh, who took his own life? You know, had a congregation of 6,000. I'm not a pastor. My dad's a pastor, but I know that world quite well. And um, I, I know that world well enough to know that pastors or people who, professors or people who speak at churches like myself aren't immune to this stuff. And um, I just want to encourage you guys to know that, like, maybe the answer to solving mental health isn't going at it directly, so to speak, but a little bit more indirectly. And using things like a 30-minute workout to just shift the attitude and the, and the, 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 the demo, honestly, the demonic, the demonic presence that might be going on. And it's not going to work every time, but it's certainly, we got to, everything we can use against it, we've got to have at our disposal. And so I just want to encourage you guys with that. I know it doesn't sound like the most encouraging thing, but if we can at least see our theological anthropology, how we're made, not just spiritual beings, but physical bodies as well, then we can perhaps have some, make some ground on this. Do you, how did you become aware that, look, I've got this skill set? Is it because you just tried it out? Like, oh, my manager was happy with these set of films, and that means I probably have some sort of gifting in this and so forth. But how did you get self-aware, so to speak, 
um, to figure out like, okay, here's what I'm deeply passionate about, here's what I'm deeply gifted in. So two separate questions. Yeah. Take from Harvard. So um, maybe the self-aware part mm -hmm. first is, you know, I think there's validation in the community and friends and in the job that helps with that. Mm -hmm. That helps say, oh, you know, you're pretty good at that. Maybe you wanna, will you lead this group and help make that happen? Mm -hmm. So I think that becomes a validation and you sort of need that along the way to test those ideas mm -hmm. and test that leadership mm -hmm. or, you know, can I really make a short movie that would work for the stewardship program at the church mm -hmm. And then it works, mm -hmm. and people are moved by it, and actually write a check. Mm. Well, that's kind of a validation yeah. that something you did in there was right, right, along with the team and everybody else. It's not just a solo effort, but you know, I, I think that validation is yeah. crucial to sort of reinforce, refine, move forward, try it again, mm. reinforce, you know, yeah, and move forward. So, so you got to be in community. To be able to absolutely. Have that affirmation. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're doing it by yourself. You're not gonna. You're gonna fail. Right. right. Um, so, yeah, I think that's been crucial for me. You know, on, on many levels. Part of that's <clears throat> a marriage. Part of that was a small group. Mm -hmm. You know, just in terms of a spiritual community to be around, and then a work group and connection and mentors and mentees that help. You know, shape all of that. You know, uh, you know, people are willing to say. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. Right. Just, just stop doing. Yeah, that. yeah. And and be this way. Don't be that way. Right. Um, you need to have people that are willing to tell you the truth mm -hmm. and do that, as well as uh, you can pass on some of that mm -hmm. to others. When you do something you say you're going to do and follow through, mm -hmm. you stand out. Mm -hmm. Because most of the culture are boneheads and won't do that. They're flakes. Mm -hmm. They won't do it. They got some excuse. Mm -hmm. But if you you make it happen. You actually make the stewardship video. You follow through, and the and the the disc is ready. You know, an hour before the banquet, and not still mm -hmm. friend. You know, mm -hmm. you do what you say you're going to do. You stand out. So good. It's, it, it's so simple. It's, yeah. And it's really old fashioned. Yeah. I can think I can hear my dad telling me that. Yeah. You know. But we can use a little old fashioned nowadays. I'm you telling you, in the movie business, you do what you say you're going to do, and you stand out. Yeah. Very simple.